Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, lessons from high-performance computing in oil and gas with special guest Keith Gray. Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks, Darren. Hey Keith, um, you you've just uh, joined um, Intel not too long ago. I mean, it, Intel a, a, a short term means you haven't had your first sabbatical, which means seven years, which is a long time. Um, but you've you've joined us just in this last year, if I remember right. Is that right? That's correct. I joined last July. So tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what you're doing at Intel. Thanks. So my background is geophysics. I got an undergraduate degree from Virginia Tech and very much hoped it would help me find career opportunities in oil and gas. And I've been able to work my whole career in oil and gas, worked really closely with Intel for a significant fraction of that. And it was exciting to get the opportunity to join and see the world from this side. When I first came out of university, I did seismic processing, quickly moved into seismic software development. With Amico, I get the experience to work in a technology evaluation and deployment team. And in 99, I was asked to lead the high performance computing group. We consolidated resources from the Amico Tulsa Research Center in Tulsa. We moved compute from Denver and New Orleans into Houston and started off our new journey with BP in January of 99 with one tenth of a teraflop of compute power. We had, One tenth of a teraflop is like my phone now, right? I mean, it's crazy. It's probably less than your phone. Um, at that point, we had about 50 or 60 SGI power challenge and origin systems. And we had the largest collection of thinking machine CM5 systems outside of the US government. We wow. were putting this all together in an environment where oil prices had fallen by more than 75%. We were consolidating a company. We were gathering a group of people that was considerably smaller than what had been managing HPC in multiple sites. But we were successful putting it together. We worked as an extension of the Seismic Imaging Research Group and supported them while they demonstrated the value and became an integral part of BP's oil and gas exploration, development, and production operations. So what were some of the biggest challenges you had with that consolidation? Oh, during the consolidation, it was bringing everything together, putting it all into a facility that had originally been designed in the the mid 1980s to support IBM mainframes. So there were facilities challenges. We quickly ran out of the power and cooling capabilities of that building. I actually got to make lots of new friends in December of uh, 2004 when we deployed one of the first new systems after the merger and we popped the main circuit breaker for a building that had over 4,000 people. Oh, oh, so so everyone knew it was your fault then, Keith. Yes, they did. (laughs) So, so, you know, power, power and HVAC are always big concerns with HPC clusters, right? Because high, there's a lot of power that goes into a rack, right? Um, so how did you overcome the, I mean, did they have to build a whole new facility? So I mean, what'd you guys end up doing? So 
I was able to define the requirements, justify a completely new facility, and then help you know, lead the project through construction and the move in. So in 2004, we were able to patch that building, put in additional UPS and um, computer room air conditioners to support growth. But by 2007, 2008, it became clear that something more viable was going to be required. By 2010, we'd gotten the support to design a new building. Unfortunately, in the spring of 2010, BP suffered a tragedy in the Gulf of Mexico. And that, yeah. it was all hands on deck. And so even high performance computing was asked to participate. Our team supported computational fluid dynamics to understand if you could actually lower a capping stack onto the Macondo well. So our CFD analysis was valuable in that uh, theoretical exercise and supported the conclusion of that tragedy. By 2011, we got support to go forward with the design. We broke ground in, I think, May of 2012 and finished construction and move in by October of 2013. So, so almost nine years so after coming, you through that coming, circuit breaker. Coming from the big oops until the um, opening ceremony of the new building was about nine years. Probably wow. the first seven of that was just patching the facility that we had, building the business case. We looked wow. at lots of different options co-location, uh, we looked at shared HPC capabilities. We had a number of benchmarks that we did to look at how cost-effective our team was and what kind of capabilities we were delivering. And through that process, we're able to justify the continued growth of the HPC and the construction of a dedicated facility. So that's really interesting because around 2011 or so, cloud technology was really starting to just blow up, right? I mean, it was really starting to become popular. And so you got you guys did the analysis that having your own facility instead of maybe running all your HPC workloads in the cloud was was viable. Yes, and we have revisited that study pretty often over the last eight, ten, eight to 10 years. Why was it so cost effective to run your own? So there's a number of points to that. Um, one is having a dedicated resource means you have control you can focus on priority. I am, uh, you'll have to decide whether you wanna keep this or cut it, but I've been arrogant enough to say any idiot should be able to keep up with Moore's law, but it takes <laughs> somebody that is aggressive and able to deliver new technologies to do almost twice as good as Moore's Law. And a lot of that came through our real clear partnership with Intel, that we paid attention, we worked closely, we were willing to do things at scale with Intel to test new ideas and new products. Um, so we were probably the largest commercial installation of Intel Itaniums by 2004. 
that gave wow. us more than a 10x price performance step compared to proprietary Unix systems and small volume, interesting but challenged processors like MIPS. And okay. Okay. then we worked closely with Intel. We were a very early adopter of Nehalem technology that gave almost a 4x price performance bump. And balancing the value that we could deliver to BP, um, we looked at that. We actually still benefit from the flexibility that a bespoke architecture can deliver. So we, we scale the networks to fit our needs. We're able and willing to use interesting processors. We had probably the second largest commercial installation of Knight's Landing. We have, uh, BP still has, and one of the key clusters they have at the moment is a Cascade Lake AP system. It's the first, you know, truly scaled water cooled deployment that BP has done. Um, when you look at the cloud, you still have a limited bandwidth to get data back and forth. And so when you are dealing with huge data volumes, that can be quite a challenge. A typical input volume can be as much as 200 to 500 terabytes. Another uh, reality of working in oil and gas is that the researchers would call us typically on a Friday afternoon <laughs> and ask the operations team lead who was responsible for resource allocation, hey, David, I'm about to run a job. I'm going to submit it to run over the weekend. It's going to create maybe two petabytes of intermediate results. Where do you want me to put that? They didn't ask, where is it? They didn't give us six months warning. They didn't say, are you busy with other customers? They said, I'm about to submit a job. It's going to run. Are you going to take care of me? Yeah. And it was our job to make sure that happened. So between the architectural freedom to take on new technologies, picking an architecture that gave us great price performance and the, the challenges of moving seismic data, having a bespoke facility that could you know, really focus on what BP's research needed was valuable. So do you, do you think that's, um, if I were to generalize that outside of um, the oil and gas industry, other people that are doing their HPC clusters, is that a common, those, those, those three things, are they common in other um, industries as well, where I'm dealing with super huge amounts of data? I mean, two petabytes of intermediate data, that's a lot of data. And I need to be bleeding edge, not cutting edge. I need to be way out there working with um, Intel directly to um, look at the latest and greatest accelerators and or CPUs. I, is this is this always going to be the case? Or can I start running some of these HPC workloads in the, in the general um, cloud that's out there? What do you think? I think that it really comes down to your business. For BP, we had a mixture of very high priority technical service work and some fundamental seismic imaging research that had to be delivered. We could keep a cluster fully utilized all the time, but when we had a high priority project, we could dedicate 100% to that work. There's still no guarantee that you may be able to ask for 300 
350,000 cores in the cloud and get that in an hour or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. The, the scale that the scale that you're talking about, most people don't do. I mean, when I do, I, I do software development um, still today. I, I have fun doing it and I'll go to the cloud and I'll say, oh, I, I need a thousand cores. No problem. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking 350,000 cores, uh, that's that's a that's a different story on a high performance, low latency network accessible yeah, which... to a file system that can have many petabytes of storage capacity and potentially a half a terabyte a second of bandwidth to move data in and out. Those are yeah, still interesting ch technical challenges. Yeah. There are other companies in the oil and gas industry who have a different demand model. There are seismic companies that deliver services to the major oil and gas companies, and they have spikes in their demand, and it becomes much more practical for them to collaborate with the cloud. Okay. So there are some that there are some use cases. It sounds like where that where the cloud can be leveraged, and um, you have to have a certain economy of scale to be able to compete. And once you reach that economy of scale, you can continue to justify growth. But there are, you know, there there's internal conversations about strategy. There's you know, what's the long-term future of oil and gas? Right now, it's very clear that our industry needs to deliver cleaner fuels, do it more effectively, but we're going to be part of the energy mix for many decades. I want to talk about um, acquiring talent because um, this this has popped up in a couple of my podcasts recently when I talk to people. There seems to be um, a, a, a gap that no one's really talking about as the baby boomers um, are starting to retire. And all that knowledge, especially around high performance computing and in technical computing, is there, a, is there a huge gap that you're seeing? And how do you find that talent? And how, how do you um, develop that in your organization so that you don't have a gap in, in continuity um, in running these HPC clusters and utilizing them effectively? So the oil and gas industry has recognized the great crew change for more than a decade. Oh, that's an interesting way to call it, the great crew change. I that's, love that. That's the way we called it. There were significant number of people that came into the industry from the late 1970s until about the first oil price collapse in 85, 86. And at that point, oil prices dropped. Um, Geez, they had gotten close to $50 a barrel, and in the spring of 86, they were less than 10. Wow. Wow. So you can imagine when your revenues are cut by 75, 80%, what happens to the man companies that manage to survive? They go through lots of changes. And we went through those times where we really did not hire. And then about 15 years ago, it became clear we needed to grow capabilities. And when you look, the skills required for high performance computing are, they're still unique. They still require brilliant people to come in. You, oil and gas has to compete with the technology industry over the last five to eight years, we've lost a lot of people off to tech. The way that our team at BP managed to accomplish growing our skill sets 
was by making really key friendships at a number of universities, identifying people early, bringing people in for one or two internships, looking for people that not only had the drive and the skills, but they had the right cultural fit. So our team's job was to sit next to the seismic imaging reservoir simulation researchers and have an applied mathematician, a computer scientist, a geophysicist that loved to do software development, sitting next to a researcher who understood the mathematics and the domain science and have one domain specialist and one computing specialist deliver more than three times the work of that individual by themselves. That's very rare to find and to form these teams. That must have been very difficult. And continues? It continues. The only way that you accomplish this is by a long-term commitment, continuing to bring in internships, thinking about your pipeline out five, six, seven years, identifying well, students, that... funding fellowships, and, yeah, and then... That's a very different model than most high tech. I mean, most high tech, it's like bring you in two or three years, burn you out, and then throw you away. No, this is... So this is, this is like a career. When you get in, you're there, right? If you get in and you are able to recognize how you can make a contribution, then you create a role for yourself that is so valuable that you're going to be needed for a very long time. Are there any other challenges that you ran into um, that you overcame or that maybe you ran into and you went, oh, I botched that completely. Um, anything that you can give other people advice on how to, how to really create these uh, service oriented organizations? So I think one of the challenges is how do you create a shared vision for where you want to be in three to five years? It's hard to get much past that, but making friends outside of BP and talking to people and building a network of contacts was really valuable for our success. We oh, made... Why is that? I mean, aren't, aren't those contacts sometimes competitors? Sometimes, yes. But... Most of the work that's being done in high performance computing in oil and gas companies is <clears throat> it's clearly not a commodity, but it is it's something that we all understand we've got to go deliver, and there's not a ton of secrets. Gotcha. Even in the seismic imaging research it's hard to keep a secret for more than a year or two or three. BP strategy for intellectual property was to be the first delivered for BP's most critical assets and then share it so that it becomes more widely available, rise the tide for everyone. For everyone, interesting have, concept. Have vendors that can deliver the more commodity work. And then as you rise, as the tide rises, you stay focused on the most important work. One of the, one fun story in 2002, 2003, two of my best friends came up with an idea. They recognized that the geologic structures 
in the Gulf of Mexico that we truly cared about were obscured by salt structures above them. And the way of understanding the subsurface was by um, putting energy into the earth, having it propagate, and then putting a set of receivers. Think of it as an antenna. And then capturing that energy when it comes back to the surface. And so my friends realized that much of the energy we were propagating in the earth wasn't coming back to the antenna that we were pulling behind the boats. So these, these friends came up with two different solutions. One was instead of pulling you know, a small number of cables with receivers behind a single boat, let's put multiple boats out there and let's take the energy source out from directly in front of that string of receivers and put it further away so that we can plan the array uh, uh, paths of the energy and understand we want the antenna where the energy comes back to the surface because we want to illuminate the areas that have oil and gas. And so in 2004, we went off and did two different experiments. One with this new technology called Wyatt Asthma Toad Streamer. The other where we contracted with the company, taught them how to build little computers that were placed on the seabed. And the first experiment we did was in between four and 6,000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico. So we did these two experiments. The interesting thing though, was during these experiments, our competitors were flying helicopters over the Gulf, watching what we were doing. Of course, yeah. Instead of having one boat with one set of air guns, and one set of uh, receiver strings, we have multiple boats and air guns on different, different boats spread out more widely. And so the first time we did it, people were wondering whether we were crazy or brilliant. The second time that we did it, they realized BP's not off doing an experiment the second time, if it didn't succeed the first. The first, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so everybody really had enough intuition on what was going on to think about what, what's happening. So at that point, keeping a secret is challenging. You've already contracted with a company like PGS to acquire the data. So they're telling their friends, your guys are talking. So we publish that information and, you know, the challenge of delivering that computationally and operationally was interesting. We send helicopters out to the boats once a week to do crew changes and we would bring hard drives full of the newly acquired seismic data, put it onto a hotshot truck, drive it to Houston, one of the people in our team would pick it up from the driver on Saturday morning, load it in, we'd be processing. And by Monday or Tuesday, people were standing in front of their workstations wanting to look at the image. And before, That's incredible. We, before we were halfway finished, this $50 million experiment was delivering better results than the traditional method of acquiring seismic that we'd employed for, you know, easily the previous two decades. That's it. That's incredible. All, all was what we're going to call a helicopter network. It was a <laughs> helicopter network. That is incredible. It was a. What was the bandwidth? Late, latency was really low, but the bandwidth was probably pretty high, right? The bandwidth have... is huge. The yeah. running joke <laughs> is that the bandwidth of a 50 foot. 53 foot trailer or a 747 is just almost infinite. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. 
Well, hey, Keith, this has been wonderful uh, talking uh, today. Where where do you see HPC going in the future? Do you so, still do you still see us having our own clusters? Do you see one massive cluster run by you know BP that everyone can use in their life? Where where do you see things going? So that's that's kind of an interesting broad question. I think that as our industry goes forward. We'll have to continue to collaborate, whether we ever get to a place where we collaborate on a huge shared HPC cluster, or if we just collaborate on some of the foundational science benchmarks, some of the uh, data handling routines that really don't create significant volume. We're definitely collaborating on developing people. Intel is funding a project at the University of Texas Advanced Computing Center to do benchmarking for seismic algorithms, hire students that are mentored by the TAC staff and by industry experts to help grow the talent we're going to need. So we'll, we'll find ways to collaborate. We'll find ways to compete. The challenge is still out there for us. Today, if we had a computer that was 100 times larger, we would find a way to use that very, very quickly. We have There's ideas on increasing the resolution by a factor of two that require almost 20x more compute. We have ideas on using more of the physics and taking away some of the simplifying assumptions that need 30 or 40x more compute. It's still a fun business. Yeah, it sounds like it. Well, hey, Keith, this has been wonderful. Thank you for your great insight into the industry, specifically around oil and gas. Um, any last words for our listeners today? No, I think this is still an exciting time. When people think about coming to work in oil and gas, bringing mathematics, computational skills, a willingness to collaborate, a, a capability of being driven to solve challenging problems is going to be a recipe for having a brilliant, interesting career. Hey, I, I agree. This is awesome. Thanks a lot, Keith. And uh, until next time. Thank you, Darren. Thank you for listening to Embracing Digital Transformation today. If you enjoyed our podcast, Give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or YouTube channel. You can find out more information about Embracing Digital Transformation at embracingdigital.org. Until next time, go out and do something wonderful.